So I got the signal to start. Uh, so the official start is now. And um, first of all, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, a warm welcome from my side for those who are participating here today in the room, but also those who are joining us um, in or the online. So um, yes, a warm welcome, a warm welcome also today to this policy debate that we will be having uh, during the next um, few hours. And the debate is on architecture for a just transition. The idea of this policy debate is to bring together architects and other stakeholders of the construction and um, building sector to demonstrate with the best practice examples how transition towards a climate neutral Europe until 2050 can be delivered. How this transition can look and feel like, I think it's an emotional approach as well, in our daily lives, in our buildings, neighborhoods, cities, and villages. There are great examples in Europe, but they have to be scaled up. Action is needed. Change has to happen now. Dr. Judith Kempion will be the master of ceremony <laughs> today. And um, I thank her especially for her engaged work in the work group, um, always called ESA, Environment Sustainable Architecture. And um, together with my A-Sport colleague, Karl Backstrand, um, Pierre Obaitek as senior policy officer of the ACE, and Jack Timmerman as chair of the uh, ACE New European Bauhaus work group, they really make a great team to advocate and bring these crucial topics forward. And obviously, I also thank the whole team in the office, in the background, supplying um, the possibility to execute this event today. I'm really looking forward to the presentations that we will uh, be hearing from different speakers throughout Europe uh, who will be presenting inspiring best practice examples and I thank them for their participation and their contribution. I'm looking forward to that and we organize the day in two sessions. Um, as next after me, Scott um, McCauley will be presenting, will have his keynote. Uh, we already discussed it today in the work group. Looking forward uh, to your uh, keynote today. And then we will have the second session where we will have um, Greta, Kathy, Karl, uh, Felicia, and Helena showing their best practices and giving their presentations. So looking forward to that. And for those in the room, we will also have a cocktail. And um, the rest, unfortunately, you will have to drink your cocktail at home. But um, I think we will deal with that. So, um, just to give a short introduction, the Architects Council of Europe represents the architects in Europe since over three decades. And our network is growing. Today, through our 51 member organizations, we represent over 620,000 architects in Europe from 35 countries in Europe. Countries like Norway, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, uh, Montenegro, Turkey, Serbia, Ukraine, and the Republic of North Macedonia form part of the Architects Council of Europe. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, assesses the impacts of climate change looking at ecosystems, biodiversity, and human communities at global and regional levels. And the report shows clearly, extremes become more widespread and pronounced with every increment of warming and architecture and urban planning has a crucial impact on making a difference for the future. Our nature has to be protected for the next generation. And nature shows bluntly its force without mercy. The devastating destruction in Turkey makes clear how important the quality of our built environment is. If regulations and rules are not maintained, people fall victim to a breach of duty of care. Unnecessary loss is suffered. Or, looking to Italy, the series of flooding at the beginning of May in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy, 
not only causing widespread damage to the plains, but also displacing thousands of people with their families and destroying their homes. The world is facing a Zeitenwende, a change of era. And that means that the world after is no longer the same as it was before. These are the words of the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in his government declaration at the end of February 2022, three days after Russia's unimaginable invasion of Ukraine in violation of international law. And I personally deeply regret that the term a Zeitenwende is now associated with injustice, violence and suffering of thousands. Because what is about to happen in the building sector is also a Zeitenwende. And afterwards, the built environment will no, be, no longer be the same as it was before. And that, to the ears of architects, and I think we are a few architects here today, together, online and in presence, and to creative people in general, is a promise of a future with a future. In view of climate change, scarcity of resources and the energy crisis in Europe, Europe wants to become the first climate neutral continent until 2050. And I cannot repeat it often enough. To achieve this transformation, the European Union is explicitly addressing the built and living environment as a part of a broader climate change and resilience strategy the Green Deal, the climate law, and the renovation wave. The current energy performance of building directives, the EPBD, is one of the important part of this strategy. And ACE is advocating for an ambitious approach in order to ensure quality standards in architecture and urban development throughout legislative procedures. In combination with the new European Bauhaus, the quality of the living environment must, must be in the center of this transformation. And since the beginning, the Architects Council of Europe has had an active role in the development of the new European Bauhaus. It is about creating a beautiful, sustainable and inclusive future for all of us. And to face this future, Courage is needed. Courage is the willingness to do what one thinks is right, even in the face of accepted, accepted disadvantage. It is in the nature of the task and corresponds to the nature of the architect's profession to understand weighted parameters as design forces, even to seek them outright as we will see examples throughout this debate we will have today. All these new ways of thinking open up welcome spaces for action for our European colleagues. It is about nothing less than the reconstruction of our outdated world economy of expenditure. The concept stands. We know where we want to go. We know that it can be done. We know how to do it. Some might say we cannot afford it. But no, we can't afford not to do it. And now it comes down to the quality and speed of execution. The battle for quality takes place on every scale and is present at all times. And it depends on all of us not only the architects, it's about the urban planners, landscape, engineers, but also civil society, politics, finances, culture, education and research. We all have to have an impact on this development. The sector study of the Architects Council of Europe, please enter, <laughs> you're welcome. The sector study of the Architects Council of Europe shows that the architects practices the competence units where the future is conceived and planned are small. 92% have only one to five employees and they are located everywhere. 
not only in metropolitan areas, but also in the countryside, simply everywhere. And the Zeitenwende will come when all these decentralized competence units are infected by the new idea, understanding the building stock as the key to climate protection. The future of construction lies in a new culture of conversion that adapts building and structures to changing functional and aesthetic demands. The change tackles architecture, urban fabric, infrastructure, cities and rural areas. And at the same time, a new contemporary design language emerges from the examination of the existing, which can create the Baukultur of tomorrow. Architects are agents of change, and their offices are competence units. And in this spirit, I wish us all a lot of success, good discussions today, and looking forward to the great presentations of all our speakers. Thank you very much. working hello yep it's working now thank you very much Ruth that was a really comprehensive and and insightful introduction to the event um, I am the order of the day or the afternoon rather will be we're going to see a presentation from Smock, uh, Scott <laughs> Scott Macaulay um, from um, He's the founder of the Anthropocene Architecture School. He's uh, also a core member of the um, Architects Climate Action Network. Um, he's based in Scotland and he also works for the practice archetype. Um, the theme of today's discussions will be about how we as architects can actually rise to the climate challenge showcasing case studies, experiences, both at policy level and at building level um, for us to actually debate on. Um, we are, this is a debating environment, so I would encourage all of you to, uh, to engage with the questions following Scott's presentation. We're also very lucky to have uh, Jacques Timmermans with us, um, who is responsible for the development of the ACE NEB manifesto. And, uh, and so after uh, Scott's presentation, we are going to have a debate around these short questions. Then we'll have several sort of um, Pecha Kucha style presentations of different case studies from around the EU, illustrating both architectural quality and policy innovations. And then we're going to have a, another short um, debate and please join us for drinks afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the word to Scott. Um, please fire away. Up to you, actually. <coughs> oh, where's the clicker for the presentation? Uh, is there a clicker here so I can move it for myself? Is it just? Oh, I found it. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so thank you very, very much for the invitation. It's very humbling to be asked to come all the way from Glasgow to be able to talk about this. So what I'm going to be talking about is not just kind of uh, the hypothetical. It's going to be buildings that inspire, so buildings that link towards what a just transition can be. But I'm also going to really quickly set the scene kind of globally of why we need that just transition and why a just transition can have no, it cannot end at borders. It must go globally and it must have an element of kind of global justice to it as well. So to introduce me, I'm, my name is Scott McCauley and I founded the Anthropocene Architecture School four years ago and I've taught internationally and around kind of climate literacy, spatial justice and kind of sustainable architecture. But I also work for Archetype, who are one of the kind of leading sustainable practices in the UK, blending kind of radically compassionate design with pacifist principles and natural materials as often as possible. But I come wearing many, many hats. So I also, I'm a co-producer of Scotland's Architecture Fringe. So we look, we look where architecture and culture intersect with kind of today's issues. 
and also we involve the public as much as possible. So it's always public facing work we do there. I'm a member of the Architects Climate Action Network, which is a kind of grassroots bottom up approach to campaigning for the built environment. And I also helped found ACAN Scotland, so that's another chapter. I'm also a member of Living Rent, who are Scotland's tenants union, who are also doing lots of really great power building work and engaging the public with the quality of our built environment. So why are we here? So uh, Naomi Klein put this incredibly eloquently in the book On Fire. So it just so happens that we are all alive at the last possible moment when changing course can mean saving lives on a truly unimaginable scale. So the kind of Built, uh, energy efficiency in the built environment and the renovation wave is not just about numbers and units and energy and carbon, it's about saving lives. Every increment of heating we deny, that is saving millions of lives. But on the left hand side, we have the recently expanded Stockholm Resilience Centre work on the, the safe and just planetary boundaries. So we now know the kind of the level of overshoot that has come from the kind of the global north and the west, and we have actually broken seven out of eight of these. So we know where we are, but what, where do we go from there? So from here, we have the work of the IPCC as well. So I'm, I probably bring down the average age in the room just a little bit. But it's when we look at who's going to be impacted by climate change into the future, uh, generations like mine and younger are going to be affected by it a great deal more. But the problem is we don't have the power, whereas it's currently concentrated with people who are significantly older, predominantly with a lot of wealth behind them. So the, as you go along this, you can see that people, bo ch uh, children born today are going to have a radically different future than anyone born 10, 20, 30 or 40 years ago. But the thing is, how, what do we do in the kind of built environment? So if we're going to do that, we, where we need to be is net zero. We need to be able to be driving down the, not just the energy, but the embodied carbon emissions. So part of that is... Globally, buildings represent one third of all the energy that we use. So by tackling this, we can reduce how much we need to generate. So the less we need to generate, the faster transition is. But we need to be remembering that offsetting has been pushed heavily as not a solution. We've seen in lots of the fires in Canada, lots of these monocrop forests have been what's been burning. There's not the same resilience in monoculture. So one proven method for driving down these emissions on energy is the passive house standard that I won't delve into at great length. There's lots of other people who can talk about that better than I can. But at the same time, I'm going to talk about demand reduction, because when we talk about a just transition, we are not just talking about changing the energy generation. So when we look at just today, regulation really looks about the primary energy, so where energy is coming from, so predominantly fossil fuels, a little bit of renewables so far. But the architectural input at them historically has been to the end of this. So it's been to our, we've been intervening in a system not set up for us to design sustainable buildings. But if we bear that in mind, expand upon it, we can start to look at where has this been done well. So two really good examples of reducing the final energy of buildings. Uh, Letty, who are the Low Energy Transformation Initiative, have done climate emergency design guides. They set energy use intensity targets. Another fantastic example is the Scottish Futures Trust, where schools are given funding as if they can demonstrate a proven energy target for 25 years consistently. So by using methods like the PASFA standard, we've revolutionised how we design school buildings in Scotland. But we can't stop at energy. We need to look at things like whole life carbon, the transparency in the supply chain. This has to be holistic. This has to go beyond just the energy component of architecture. And when we look at a just transition in the UK, this is probably my favourite new slide. So in the UK, if we want to hit our minimum legal obligations on retrofit, we need to employ two million people. That's one retrofit every 35 seconds. But the thing is, we only have 135,000 people in that industry today. So we are quite short. So when you take those numbers and set it beside for every one job in oil and gas in the UK, we have 26,000 people employed by the industry. There are three jobs needing done in renewable energy. So there's three jobs for every one person in the oil and gas sector wanting a job. But for every one job in oil and gas, there are 77 jobs in the retrofit of our homes. We don't currently have that as a policy discussion back in the UK. In Scotland, kind of. UK, no. But that is what a just transition looks like. There are so many jobs. We have got jobs for generations. These should be well-paid, unionised, consistent jobs. But that's what the UK looks like for a just transition. The built environment is going to be an incredible bounty for us doing really good things for people's lives. But we need to remember for a just transition, we have to look at the global dynamic. 
So 92% of carbon emissions that pushed us beyond a safe threshold, so 350 parts per million, came from the global north. The global south, we're currently facing the vast extent of climate impacts, emitted 8%. So at COP26, which is in my home city of Glasgow, uh, Miyamoto, the Prime Minister of Barbados, said really, really powerfully was, for those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have heart to feel, 1.5 degrees is what we need to survive. So this is a justice problem as well. This is There has to be an element of global justice when we apply our, to looking at the work on our own built environment. But also we need to look historically further back even more. So just in the past two months, a study was done to see how much is owed in climate reparations from the global north to the rest of the world. And there are trillions upon trillions of dollars that countries that have overshot should be finding ways to support other countries. And that brings in the concept of loss and damages that's been very it's been fought for for years and taken a very, very, very long time to get into international discussions. But now we've had the context, so I have brought you five stories from archetypes, kind of recent, not recent, maybe past decade, buildings that demonstrate that we can inspire people with what we design, with what we build, but it can also perform above and beyond what we actually need to do to deliver a net zero built environment. So archetypes ethos has been to kind of bl uh, blend this really radical approach to sustainability, beginning in kind of self-built co-housing and moving into low carbon design and to then start bringing in evidence and feedback loops of learning. So from all of the projects that we do at Archetype, we're looking at closing the loop between building and operation the next building. So every building we do is a learning resource for our co-owners to look at and improve next. So on the kind of left-hand side, you have how we've taken the RIBA kind of plan of work and turned it, instead of being a linear, you finish at the end and you just pretend you don't know it exists for a few years, you keep on going back and you, it's that concept of stewardship. So the architects of the future are going to be stewards of our built environment. It's going to be about care. It's not going to be about all creation and bells and whistles. So we've got five buildings that are inspiring. There are two schools, one university building, uh, well, three, three schools, can't count. But it's, this is just going to demonstrate that this is what we can do when we take care and when we apply principles of what we know how to do today to our built environment. So I'm going to pick again with Hackbridge Primary School, which has been kind of deemed the greenest primary school in the UK. And, and it's a beautiful space for children to learn, to be close to nature. It's built from natural materials. It's a really, it's a beautiful building and it has been get shown the kind of attention from elsewhere that it really deserves. But to look at this, it's not just an energy exemplar. It looks at the embodied carbon of the building. So it's actually, this school uses half of the embodied carbon of a comparable normal business as usual built school. So this is just showing where it stands and what kind of tools we use to look at the embodied carbon of that building. So kind of from there as well, we can look at the kind of what is the operational carbon of that building. So we then move into looking at a kind of a fabric first approach. It's operationally net zero, but at the same time, it meets targets for 2030 and 2025. So it's been designed a few years prior, but it's still beyond the curve. It's not just meeting the minimum legal requirements, it's pushing beyond to show what can actually be done. And again, this is a quote from testimony from kind of the teachers there is an inspiring place that shows what is possible and children uh, dancing around, pleasantly enjoying the building above everything else in the photograph. And then looking at the kind of the outcomes of that school in comparison to other projects and to reference Judith's book as well. So we need to give you a shout out for pulling this together. But by going to the kind of passive house and beyond, it becomes a world class exemplar on what is possible. So this is replicable anywhere. You can now build a school that functions to that standard and we should not be building schools that don't hit that standard. And then, so how did we get there? How did we get to doing these exemplars? So this is all about learning and completing loops. So this is Wilkinson Primary School. It is as part of the kind of second generation of archetypes schools that were developed. So in looking at this, this was about looking at past projects. So instead of starting from ground zero, we have the brief for a school, archetype looked at the past schools they had done and dug into those and analyzed them. What worked, what didn't work, was extensive POE process. It's now being a further study looking at kind of indoor air quality. But just to look at the kind of how big are the quantities it's reduced. So in terms of gas use, it's 90% less. So we can design buildings that use 90% less gas than we currently need to use. And it's replicable and doable. 
And at the same time, when you compare that with the gas and energy, it's still a huge reduction. So this is just again showing this is all entirely possible. There are a few graphs that I'll jump through, but if you follow the blue line on all of them, it just stays below in the thermal comfort of the time. So it keeps that environment for children. It's not just, it's not just about productivity. It's about making it healthier for them, making it an enjoyable experience to come to school. It's not somewhere that you go and you feel really hazy and sickly in the afternoon because the building's not designed properly. But it's just looking at these different kind of metrics. This is being recorded, so if you're really interested, you can go back. I'm not going to bore the audience in the room with too many graphs. But when you look at the indoor air quality, it is so much better than what is, ne what is actually the legal bare minimum in the UK. So it's a fantastic example. And then have, of the five I'm going to show, my favourite one of these. This is the Enterprise Centre. So it's from the University of Anglia. This is a mixed-use, very adaptable, climate-resilient, and a building designed for a 100-year life cycle. So not for the minimum of the average in Europe of 42 years for 100. And it was one of 17 buildings chosen during COP26 to be exhibited by the kind of World Building Council. And it's also, there was a, in London, there was the launch of the Open City Stewardship Awards. So it's one of the winners of this new type of award, which is not just about architectural aesthetics, it's about long-term stewardship into the future. And it's just, part of this was not just about understanding what the client wanted, but it was to push beyond that. So it was an adaptable and mixed use. There's that 100-year design life. The embodied carbon is incredibly low, but it's about looking at supply chains, so using local materials and reinterpreting traditions in different ways. But also built into the contracting was a three-year post-occupancy study. So they knew from the beginning this building was going to be checked every single year for a few years to be optimised. But now they know that for seven years in a row, it's been performing just exactly as promised and designed because it's been designed to pass those standard and through these metrics. And also it needs to have one, it needs to have, it has 75% less visits for maintenance than every other building on the campus, which is an amazing accomplishment in itself. But it's also that local impacts and the global perspective. So as much as by using thatch in a new way to create a really beautiful outdoor space, the embodied carbon was significantly lower than comparable buildings. And then for the well-being, to look at kind of building user survey as well, it is in the top kind of 98% of all of these studies for health and on productivity, on health, productivity and health top 99. And again, lots of kind of testimonial just to say from people, this makes me feel better to be in a space that has been kind of created with the intention of uplifting and inspiring people. And that's just what it looks like in a lecture theatre when you expose all the timber and it's a really beautiful place to learn. It is on my list of buildings. I'm going to find an excuse for Archetype to send me to to visit. We then have Harris Academy Sutton, which is another exemplar in kind of primary school design and showing, again, what is possible. So that's, again, at the pass for standard. It's at the top kind of percentage possible of kind of the deck ratings on A. And it's about bringing nature closer to children and letting children spend more time outdoors by using sustainable materials in such a way that it's inspiring people. And it's also, when you compare this to your average school in the UK, it's got 69% less impact on its total life cycle. So we can now be designing buildings 69% better than we could. And all of them should be to that standard. And it's replicable. It's not impossible. It's also been very part of Archetype's kind of ethos is to share what we learn. So even if we don't hit the furthest possible standard on the RIB 2030 challenge, we say this is where we got to. We're also in the practices contributing to Letty's case studies, where we're making it publicly known and sharing how we achieve the different elements. And there's now the kind of the final one, which is a bit wildcard and different, is the Duxford Paper Store. So Archives are typically incredibly energy intensive because you've got to create a stable environment to keep valuable objects in an optimum kind of range of kind of comfort, humidity, etc. So for this, it uses 95% less energy than its comparable kind of counterparts. So 95% is a huge saving, but also it costs 45% less than its counterparts to build. So by doing it well, it costs us less, which is fantastic. And it's got the most unexciting fluctuations in indoor kind of conditions. So because of the pacifist standard, that graph is not fluctuating into dangerous territory. So it's incredibly boring. But when you ask how much does it cost to run a building of this incredibly high standard, so you might think for an entire year, you must be looking at thousands upon thousands of pounds. Well, no, you're looking at about a thousand euros to run this paper store for an entire year. So it costs less than a thousand euros to keep things in the optimum perfect environment. It costs 45% less to build and uses 95% less energy. So by using these methods, we can bring in fantastic things for people. 
And this is with the site team. The site team were just told, you've beat the world airtightness record. And there was just joy. They took so much enjoyment in building upon the quality. So they had never built a passive house building before. This was their first ever one, and they set a world record. So this is showing that by taking the time and the care, this is what's possible. And this, if it can be done for archives, it can definitely be done for housing. It can be done for anything. So what are the kind of the lessons that we've learned? So actually, it's more about relationships. It's as much about relationships and design as technology. It's not just about flashy gadgets. It's about the interrelationships between the end users, the, the contracting team, the design team. It's involving architects beyond completion using BPE. So it's that kind of longer term stewardship is essential to realizing a just transition. But also early engagement and upscaling at scale is really important. We have a huge gap in what we need to deliver this in capacity. So a just transition is an energy and industry and a policy challenge because in architecture schools, we are incredibly far behind what's necessary to prepare students for the future. But also we need the average age in the UK of a person on a building site is about 52. So we've got this huge kind of void of people who are going to start leaving a, pro a profession and we are not bringing enough people in. So we need 2 million people but in, an a in an industry where the average age on site is 52. So again, we need that cultural transformation that cannot just be about technology. But also policy at the moment does, at the moment does not push as far as what is possible. So these buildings were all done voluntarily. The only reason they are good was they chose to, they decided to, there was persuasion, there was a story sold, there was a narrative, and they went above and beyond. So we need policy and regulations that make this normal, because these all can and should be the norm. So on an educational front, what I do with the Infrops and Architecture School is from very kind of like community level, so from tenants or unions and branches, all the way up to now talking to you at EU Sustainable Energy Week, to taking people on site to the Windford in Glasgow, where there are 600 social homes, where a community is having to resist the demolition of their homes, all the way to architecture as climate on the bottom right-hand side, and the top left was retrofit reimagined. So I've done this in all sorts of places and taught about five odd thousand people. And this is what that kind of looks like. So I've done work as far as kind of uh, UC Berkeley, University of Toronto, but there is such, this is the failure demand of the architectural education system. So I graduated I'm going to give a little away about kind of five, four or five years ago, and I have taught plus of 5,000 people. Arch 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 architectural institutions really should have been doing that themselves as well. And they could also jump in because there's such a, a richness and so much that needs done, and so many people wanting to learn at the same time. And this brings me into the, the grassroots side of that. So the Architects Climate Action Network came from the ground up, was literally founded on a bridge during a protest in Extinction Rebellion's work mm -hmm. protest in 2019. And everything is done through consensus. So in ACAN, there is no person in charge. There's no president. There are people who coordinate and link things, but there are not people making decisions for the whole. And that gets a lot done. But ACAN's sort of structure is really, the fascinating thing is that by dispersing all these things into different work groups and work extremes from the climate literacy group that I used to help coordinate to existing buildings policy, it's been a fantastic way to energize younger practitioners who typically do not give in the space to, they don't, they're not able to take up the space in all the traditional construction industry, but they can create that space from the ground up and invite more people in, and that's incredibly crucial at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. There's also the kind of, I'm going to bring in some Scottish stuff because we're Europeans at heart. Uh, we've set a kind of for 2024, there's going to be a passive house equivalent with the embodied carbon set for all of our new housing. So that's been fought for, and that's involved architects and the policy decisions around that to push for it. There's a kind of net zero neighborhoods kind of framework coming from the built environment, smart transformations, and there's a massive upscaling of our kind of work workforce on site. There's lots of people pushing for this really, really, really hard. And just again, because I'm gonna bring in more Scotland as well, this, the architecture fringe kind of engages the public in a huge way, which is really necessary to do from on all fronts in Europe and to take architecture outside of our, build, our institutions onto the streets and into public spaces. Uh, Leti are the Low Energy Transformation Initiative. They produce guidelines for the buildings we need to design to meet our climate targets. Uh, the Just Transition Lobby are currently sort crowdsourcing members to run for the RIBA Council. So we are currently trying to transform our architectural institution to put a just transition at the heart and soul of everything it does. 
Uh, the Scottish Futures Trust is that funding mechanism for schools where if you demonstrate you can hit a low energy and low maintenance, you get funded long into the future. It encourages that cathedral thinking in our built environment. Uh, the Passive House Trust have been doing a fantastic job on disseminating the best practice to people and built environment smarter transformations are this innovation centre who've been pushing for training and making it accessible to as many people as possible, either free or incredibly low cost, to ensure our industry can meet the challenge that we need to meet. But also, this is not just about professions and about jobs, this is also about tenants and people. So during COP26, Living Rent had these banners linking housing justice is climate justice. So the people that live in the homes needs to be part of the conversation and how we transform them. And also at the same time, we need to remember that when it comes to making the decisions on regulations, we need to remember that lots of people do not have the same amount of power to upgrade, to renovate a home. We need things like linking energy efficiency to rent controls as far as possible to make sure it's survivable to rent a home in the EU and the UK as further abroad as well. But I'm going to end on just one of my favourite quotes of all time. So this is from Rob Hopkins in his book From What Is to What If. And actually it says... One of the fundamental challenges is that we need to be able to imagine possible, feasible, delightful versions of the future before we can create them. Not utopias, but where things turned out okay. And what we really need to be doing as architects and the new European Bauhaus and ACE and beyond is creating moments for people to imagine what that future is like and what role they play in creating it and how much of a joy it is to live there in the end. And it's just a lovely way to stop and thank you very, very much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I hope this has set the scene quite nicely. Thank you so much, Scott. And I, I can't believe you can deliver such an incredibly eloquent talk uh, after a full two half days of <laughs> workshopping as well. And it's been absolutely delightful to have your input into the, the Architects Council of Europe Sustainable Architecture work group over these couple of days. And I can't imagine a better way to, um, to, to kind of conclude these two days of working together than seeing these case studies and, and the thinking behind them. And I'm incredibly encouraged to see, you know, the buildings that inspire, that create a community around them and perform for the planet at the same time. So I wondered what questions the audience might have. Um, Thanks. Um, is this working? Yeah. Uh, Michael Neves from ECOS, Environmental Coalition on Standards. Uh, thanks for the really inspiring presentation, first of all. Really great examples. Um, I was wondering, um, twofold, if you feel like the existing building stock can be transformed in such a inspiring way, and do you think uh, there's enough capacity to deliver that from yeah from architects and from from other yeah participants in that process, let's say, and and what could be done about that, basically? Uh, yeah, so. I think when it comes to the kind of the existing building stock, there's uh, another thing that kind of uh, Rob mentioned in his book. Is that the more constraints we have on what the problems we need to solve, the more imaginative we have to be. And I think that, that I think it's a, a bit of a misnomer to say we cannot make what's standing up today be as inspiring as what we can create from scratch. And we're also dealing with the kind of the cultural history and the heritage and the richness of what's already there and what's gone into it. Recording and in I think progress. It's, it's for me personally, it's more inspiring to see someone take what somebody else has designed in the past and to make that an inspiring place for people in the future. In terms of capacity, I think that that is a very, very big task. Like, for example, in in the UK, we are a million and a half, a million and a half people short of doing the physical work. And with architects, I think there is. There needs to be a cultural, essential, literally, like what ACAN want, there needs to be a cultural shift and transformation in embracing stewardship over creation from scratch. And really embracing that this, yes, it's a challenge. Yes, it's harder to work with what's already standing up and to solve a problem than to uh, likely create problems when you design from scratch. But it's, it's all possible and there are, if I was to go through every example that inspired me, we would be here until like next month. There's so many 
kind of delightfully incredible examples of this. And I think that's what we need to be seeing more of because it's not just the high performance. There's incredible things being done, not just in like not just in the EU. We need to be looking beyond borders to what's being done elsewhere because there are fantastic examples and it's entirely possible. Thanks a lot also from my side for the presentation. My name is Sivim Aktas. I'm from the uh, DG Klima from the European Commission, um, working on uh, construction products, in fact. Um, I found it extremely inspiring because I truly believe as well it's a matter of mindset and seeing the opportunities in these type of challenges. Um, and the mindset, as you showed, makes a huge difference. I mean, I love when you were showing the... Uh, the, the, in, the installers doing the passive offs for the very first time and doing an extremely good job in it. Um, I was wondering how can we expand this um, this n not attitude but mindset and make it more well known among the architects because it really starts with the architect's mindset and designing. So I'm thinking of this um, German saying "aus dem Augen aus dem which means if you if it's not visible, it's not in your head either. So how can we make it more visible to, uh, to, uh, to the people um, on the forefront of these uh, construction projects slash architects as well? I think a lot of that comes from what it is that we celebrate. So when you look at the typical architectural awards, if you look across the past 10 years, you're probably going to see lots of very architect -y, very flashy, all new. We need to be, if you start there and start shifting what you're celebrating, and start to recognize uh, an incredible example as not just to be very techie, but there's a magazine, Passive House Plus, and if they ever show a case study, they show the performance. So if you were to immediately shift to the all awards had to show performance as well as what they were doing, you could be seeing that not only is that a, a really inspiring place, but wow, it's actually very energy efficient. But also we need to be taking the approach that's not just a professional problem, it's cultural, and to be engaging in things like festivals and any any reason to bring architecture into spaces that architecture doesn't traditionally go to. So when, when I launched the Anthropocene Architecture School, I launched it and I intentionally chose the oldest Victorian music hall in the world that's based in Glasgow instead of putting it in an exhibition hall. So we need to be taking our what we're doing and putting it where the public can see it and we need to be inviting them in. So that means not just doing our own festivals that we're doing all from scratch, but things like... Uh, for example, what I would really love to do is take that to like the Edinburgh Fringe. So you've got comedy on one side and you have architecture on the other. That would be fantastic. During COP26, uh, ACAN actually got a comedian to present to a crowd and to turn the built environment challenge and climate change into a comedy set, which was amazing. But we need to think about how we're communicating and where we're putting that. So with the kind of new European Bauhaus, you've got this great opportunity to put this in front of lots of different people. But also when architects can see it, in places they're not just associating with work and they're not just associating with high architecture or winning like accolades. And it's shifting what we celebrate as well. So I have a question. Oh, you go. Um, thanks very much, Scott. Nice to have another fellow Scott in the audience. Um, I wanted to ask when you mentioned that about moving away from the star architects as such, What's your views on someone like Yasmin Lari, who just won the Royal Institute of British Architects Award for her building million, um, a million homes across South Asia or Pakistan, and it's a way it, over two every two years, and it's in a way simplifying um, building the very basic hut, and it's not a you know how can I say comprehensive architecture or big cost and it's really about empowering the local community um is that the kind of thing that you mean when you're saying about getting away from the the sort of star buildings and the high-tech things it's really simplifying and going back to basics and learning from the indigenous things that have been happening for years i think there is there i think that definitely on that front there has to be that kind of the recognition that it doesn't for, for, for starters, it doesn't have to be in Europe or North America to be in a magazine, to be on the front cover of something. We need to embrace what's being done beautifully everywhere. And it's also, go, the impact should be, an amazing example is the Open City Stewardship Awards, which I'd thoroughly recommend that the European Bauhaus should definitely do some. So it's looking at the stewardship. So all of these projects are 
they're awarded things based on how they've engaged over the long term. So it's not just a congratulations, you've done a building, it stood up for a year, we don't know how it works, but have a sticker. Like that's what the architecture is. And it's we really need to start thinking about changing that. But it's looking at the long term and, and celebrating what's having a long term impact. Because with climate change, we need to do things today, but we also need that kind of long term cathedral thinking. So if we were just to start looking at how we're celebrating what's having a long term effect and not just on the and changing the language. So not just having it what's having like the Bilbao effect, for example, like, oh, it's had economic activity, it's revolutionary, it's transformed things. There are many very small interventions that are not museums that have done incredible things for a street, for a neighborhood. So we need to think about scale. So it's amazing to have like a architect project that brings extra people on planes, but what does something do for people that live around it as well? So taking that conversation and reshaping it and putting kind of people at the heart and soul of it. So it's not just about photographs that don't have any people in them with buildings that are probably not going to perform very well, that wouldn't stand up to a POE assessment very highly either. But that's just my opinion. So talking about scaling all of this up, um, ACE has been very active about the new European Bauhaus, which does uh, encompass many of these principles and, and thoughts. And, and, I, and I wondered whether, Jacques, you've been working on, on the ACES manifesto, and Ruth, you've been promoting the new European Bauhaus across <coughs> uh, Europe and beyond. Could you just say a, a few words on, on, on this work and where you're taking it next? Thank you, um, Judith. Yes, thank you, for the, Scott, for the very inspiring uh, presentation. Like you said to yourself, uh, it should be go further on. I think it's very inspiring because um, buildings are part of the change we have to uh, proceed. But it's more than that. Uh, if we want to succeed, uh, to take uh, control uh, about uh, disruptions and so on, it's more than climate change. It's more than um, it's, it's, it's going back to ecosystems that uh, are not disrupting and uh, change the climate and use too many times the, the uh, nature uh, qualities. We have to go further. If you want to go in 2050 on European level to not only carbon neutral, uh, but you have to go to carbon net zero, uh, we have the inspiration to work on, on the topics you showed, but that's scope one and scope two. Scope one and scope two is the direct and un indirect uh, involvement uh, and control about carbon. But it's not the control about scope three. Scope three, it's all around. You said it, it's important in the close environment of the building, but it's about all the uh, other parts. If you want to give back um, by uh, biodiversity to nature, you should less use uh, space, uh, nature space. So you have to densify urban space, villages, cities, big cities. Uh, so scope three is very important. And part of um, the answer we can find in, in the NEB tool, because NEB is uh, the bridge between um, the European Green Deal on scope one and two. But it's more than that. It's the link to the daily lives and, li and living space we have to share together. Um, so the challenge for uh, the future is how we can in convince and evolve the civil society in a cultural, inclusive and resilient approach on the future. How shall we deal as humans with the space we have to share uh, and to keep back on the control? It's a whole challenge uh, that we have uh, uh, to go and it's also an opportunity. So we are working um, inside the workshop uh, of uh, ACE on NEB. How can we clarify those three topics? How can we clarify um, it to the political uh, public authorities because they are part of the uh, uh, involvement? How can we inspire um, private uh, investors because they want to know how their money should uh, and will be used uh, in a sustainable and resilient way? Um, and also, um, it's a clarification of the message to the designers, architects, landscapers, uh, engineers, because they have to rethink also 
how to deal with uh, this uh, challenge. Uh, it's not about uh, buildings, not about only infrastructure, but it's about the whole uh, multidisciplinary approach and uh, how to make a new consistent uh, ecosystems. So the play, there is a place for architects, but they have to believe in it to be in front of the making master plans together with all uh, disciplines so that we can have an ambition that can be followed uh, step by step to the whole process of construction. And last bit, uh, last point that I want to, 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 to give is we have nice documents already existing in the <coughs> uh, Davos Declaration of 2018, the Davos uh, Alliance in Recording in 20, progress. 23, but also the Davos Bauculture Quality System is very interesting to understand and how we can clarify the message about NEB. There are eight key elements that have been identified in the Davos, Davos uh, Alliance. It's about first governance. How do you deal with governance on the qualities uh, way? How you deal with functionality of uh, the subject you're uh, designing or developing? Uh, third one is environment. For, fourth one, uh, economy, of course. Uh, fifth, diversity. After what was the context? So. Do you build up the, the context qualitatively with uh, uh, the objects? And then last but not least, the spirit of the place and the beauty of the place. It's uh, something you never heard in the Green Deal or in the taxonomy discussions, but uh, it has the place in NEB. And uh, it's an interesting uh, quality system that we have to develop and share it all together in uh, public authorities, private investors, architects, but last but not least, also with students and on the level of education. Thank you very much. Uh, are we here to see the remarks for the first part of the session? Yes, um, I think um, with the new European Bauhaus, a uh, new narrative um, has started in the European <coughs> context, meaning that um, uh, suddenly uh, the very, let's say, technocratic approach in European policy has changed towards a cultural approach, uh, towards a social approach. And I think this uh, we really have to embrace. It's a huge opportunity for the architects in the moment, at the moment. And um, Scott, what I really liked in your presentation is showing um, how uh, very smart and not thinking about smart in the obvious way it has always been used in the past, but with intelligent approach of design uh, to develop. And this is a bit the sad thing that it was just on behalf of the client he wanted to head in that direction. So there you had this fantastic situation, architect plus client work very closely together. And this has to be, and you said it wonderfully, the norm. It has to be normal and um, the, cli the clients and especially also the public client has to change because the public client has two, uh, always two perspectives. The one is the pocket, the money. You showed it. It is feasible. It is economic-wise uh, feasible. So basically, this argument doesn't count anymore. And uh, secondly, it's um, the responsibility towards the citizens. And um, this is, I think, really important. We have the responsibility towards the people, and um, the discussion is changing on, Euro on, on European level, and that's fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, and thank you very much all. And it, you know, it, it just makes the case for why we need the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive to be passed through uh, uh, the trilogues as soon as possible to not just have the very motivated clients being able to do this, but for this to become ubiquitous. And with that note, and in relationship to the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and how we can map the building stock and, the, and what does it take to do that and how that's done, um, Greta Thessera is going to be um, opening the second round of the conversation. Well, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> it's everything.
everything all right? <laughs> Good. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Ace, for the invitation in the frame of the Energy Week. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and we are really excited to be able to show uh, our project uh, and the initiatives we are uh, leading from Spain. And uh, why we do believe that uh, architects and architecture is so relevant in the path um, towards a just transition. Just as a brief introduction, I'm Greta Treserra. I'm an international consultant for sustainable development. Uh, I'm also the vice president of AUS. AUS is uh, an association in Spain where uh, we gather all architects um, uh, advocating uh, for sustainability. And uh, from this position, I represent uh, the Spanish Order of Architects, and uh, uh, we are also part of the sustainability work group uh, of, of, of ACE. Of ACE. So, so uh, uh, being, being that, that said, said uh, uh, I'll, I'll begin, begin with, with the presentation. presentation. If the if clicker, clicker allows. Okay. Okay. Did, did, okay. okay. Uh, I will start, start uh, presenting uh, uh, the Spanish, Spanish context. context. Uh, in this, this image, image uh, you, can you can see uh, on the, the gray stripe, stripe. Um, um, how, is how is the, the demand, demand of our, our building, building stock nowadays. nowadays? Um, this is sorted by, by province. And uh, the second stripe, uh, the greener one, is the scenario how it would be if we were uh, building uh, our building stack um, following the current regulations. And uh, the, the third stripe, the greener one, is uh, how it would be our building stack if we had uh, all of our buildings with an A certificate. So if, it, if they were uh, efficient uh, in energy terms. So as you can see, our building stock is very inefficient. Uh, and uh, to reach the carbon neutrality, we need to intervene at at least 50% of our buildings. Uh, another um, aspect to give you context, and now we put numbers, which has uh, always uh, a big impact. Uh, so that you have an idea, in Spain we spend yearly around uh, 40,000 millions in imported energy. Uh, if we put it in context that one third of this energy is uh, consumed in buildings, this means 13,000 millions uh, of euros. If we had an efficient building stock, uh, I mean the last stripe I showed in the slide before, if we had an A certification, we would uh, have savings of the 80% of the energy, which means 10,000 millions a year. It's, it's a big number. Okay, what, what this means? Uh, in 2013, at the peak of our uh, economical recession, we had uh, to, to do budget cuts. Um, and uh, that, what, that meant that in health, we had to reduce the budget for 7,000 millions and 3,000 millions in education. So this is exactly the cost of what we paid in energy. So now you get uh, a scope of the dimension of the problem. Uh, so this, this is uh, clear that it's urgent to, re to reach the carbon neutrality by 2050 and uh, we need uh, a different setup of things beginning for a new model to scale up the, the renovation of the sector. Uh, and we have to uh, increase the ratio by 14. So we have to renovate from uh, 25,000 uh, houses a year, which is the current situation, to three, uh, 350,000 houses. Uh, first of all, we will need a proper legal uh, framework and a set of, uh, of tools this will bring the EPBD, that's why it's so important, the, the approval. The approval. Uh, second of all, we need uh, strong partnerships between public administration, private sector, all the relevant stakeholders, and in different scales, uh, from the European scale to the national, regional, and local scale. And last but not least, we need a strong leadership. And uh, I would like to highlight this because, uh, as we were um, talking before, uh, this, is, this is the relevance of the role of the architects because we have the new European Bauhaus and an initiative launched by the President of the Commission and uh, in her own words, the new European Bauhaus is the soul of the European Green Deal. 
which means the European Bauhaus tell us how we have to do this uh, energy transformation and the three criteria, sustainability, inclusion and beautiful. It has to be beautiful and the aesthetics and the quality of the living environment has to be uh, taken into account. And it's so important, it has to be so in the center of the conversation that the uh, version of the European Parliament that uh, um, uh, was approved uh, by the end of uh, last year, already in the second page of the, of the document, mentions the new European Bauhaus. In addition to this, in Spain, we have uh, the high quality architectural law that uh, was also approved by the end of last year. Uh, here you can download the, the law. I put the QR co code because it's always something uh, very special that we in Spain have this law and it's very long to explain and I'm, I'm not an expert but you can find it here. Uh, uh, wrapping up, uh, this law wants to ensure the social, economical and uh, environmental sustainability of the projects, always integrated with the context and uh, being flexible uh, to adapt to new uses as we have a very changing society. Uh, always recognizing the identity of the context in social and cultural uh, terms uh, and uh, of course including the energy efficiency and circularity. Uh, so said that, uh, we as uh, AUS, this association I already presented, uh, we started in 2021 the project Decarbonizing Architecture. Uh, which has uh, one big goal, which is the transposition and implementation of the EPBD, the Directive uh, um, of Energy Performance in Buildings, uh, with ambition, and we see as a very strong opportunity for this paradigm shift that we uh, much need. Uh, so we are working from this, from this uh, association with five different work groups, uh, the first group is working with uh, decarbonized materials, the second group is working in the roadmaps of decarbonization of the materials, the third work group uh, is working with uh, instruments of the, of the directive, uh, some of the members are sitting here in the, next, uh, in the second row. Uh, the fourth group is working with the global agendas and the uh, fifth group is working uh, on the health issues. So we are developing uh, health indicators for all these, uh, for all these concepts. Um, as I said, we are working uh, together with uh, FESCAE, the Order of Architects of Spain. We represent them with the uh, sustainability issues and now in coordination with ACE. Uh, from ours, we have um, created this Agenda 2026, and it's uh, based on the tools from the directive, uh, the renovation passport, the digital, digital logbook, the national plan of renovation, the uh, energy certification, the MEPS, and uh, the global, uh, global warming potential and uh, also the new European Bauhaus label. label. This is so important for us that we want to, to uh, include the concept of the quality of architecture in everything uh, we will develop. Um, so what we are doing with this uh, Agenda 2026 is the yellow stripes you can see, so it's um, anticipating. If we have to uh, have all these tools implemented by 2026, that's why uh, the, the name of the agenda. We already started last year to uh, begin with uh, debates, to prepare, uh, to prepare reports, uh, to prepare um, the, the proper uh, training for our architects, uh, proper accreditation, and uh, what we want is to have a proactive um, um, uh, attitude toward all the challenges that uh, we are facing and the problem of not being uh, proactive is that when you get the challenges you are not ready and we don't have public administrations ready and the sector is not ready and the architects are not ready. Exactly what we are uh, living now unfortunately in Spain with the uh, next generation funds and we got a lot of money and we are not able to spend them and that's, that, that cannot happen again. Uh, so we are also generating tools to support architects uh, through informative sessions, uh, workshops. Uh, also, we are uh, designing specialized training to skill up uh, our architects with the accreditation of the national order. Um, this will be ready by the end of the year. And we are also preparing a set of tools, such portfolio for decarbonized materials, because our architects honestly don't, don't know how to use uh, materials 
a little bit further than timber and we can explore health and we can explore uh, vegetal fibers and uh, a huge list. Uh, also provide uh, bioclimatic solutions. How can we, uh, through passive design, uh, reduce the demand on, on energy, provide CO2 uh, measurement tools, roadmaps to, uh, towards decarbonization of materials, etc. Uh, something very rele relevant that we did last year uh, in this in this frame was to organize this kickoff event of the of the project uh, in a in a session in Barcelona. It was like nine hours uh, of uh, conferences. The auditorium was full. We had like uh, almost 400 uh, attendees and um, it was a big success. I will pass it very, very quick. We had uh, um, an opening session from, uh, with authorities from different levels. From uh, the European level, we had uh, Ruth with us, a member of the European Parliament. We had also members of, the, of our national government and the regional government. Uh, the first session was to inform uh, which are these agendas for the change with a, uh, with a big highlight on the new European Bauhaus, which is the call for architects to be in the center of the discussion. Uh, the second session was to explain which are these key instruments with a uh, very focus on the passport, uh, uh, the renovation passport and the di digital logbook. Uh, the third session was to give these solutions, how we can uh, uh, fight this embodied carbon in the materials through design and, um, and changing uh, strategies in design. Uh, and uh, then we organized some workshops to um, get hands-on with uh, these different tools. And uh, as a closing session, we had uh, an agreement to work towards a common agenda that was uh, here. You can download the agenda of the event and uh, you can also see the videos of the session. As I said, it was a very long session, very interesting. Uh, it's subtitled in, in English. And uh, to finish the session, uh, the, the Barcelona Declaration was signed, which is a document uh, that compromises to gather all these stakeholders together and to work together to, towards decarbonization, uh, recognizing the leadership of the architects. Here you can download the, the document. Um, and uh, another strategy we are doing from the project is support policymakers. First of all, we are uh, working very hard on communication. Uh, beginning with uh, with our uh, ministries, here you can see in the picture we are um, uh, having regular meetings with uh, with uh, the housing ministry and the general directors to create awareness so that they can they understand the the importance of the approval of this EPBD and uh, all the the uh, changes that will uh, imply um, making technical support uh, reports to this build these fears and, and build trust in the institutions and building a positive speech. How the EPBD and all this transformation will be very positive, not, not only for we architects, but also for society in terms of job creation, uh, creating markets, um, uh, improving quality of life uh, of citizens in, in general. Uh, also for the model, uh, we, and now I say uh, it, it's not me, it's these people say, sitting in the, in the second row that already did a brilliant presentation this morning, so if you have questions you can address to them. Uh, we are developing uh, tools of data collection and integration, generation and visualization of knowledge, uh, coordination of uh, different scales and stakeholders, always from the local, regional and national level, and uh, having tools to plan in the long term. Uh, here you can see on the, on the right hand, uh, this is the planning uh, of the building stock in the Basque Country, uh, how will evolve the energy certifications from now to, 20, uh, to 2050, so we can uh, have um, the decarbonization of the building stock possible. And uh, last but not, not least, we are also uh, supporting uh, our government in the Spanish presidency of the European Council, uh, also uh, making a lot of um, co uh, positive communication, positive speech, uh, organizing site events on the different meetings they will hold uh, in Valladolid, the Ministry for Energy, and in Gijón, our Ministry for Housing, uh, and uh, basically uh, writing reports so that they, they can use to make, to make policies. 
Uh, so to finish, challenges are huge, we know that, but it's, it's up to you to make it possible. And quoting uh, Ruth, our president, we cannot afford not to do it. So thank you. really wonderful to see how much is happening in Spain and 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 I I know that the um, passing the fit for 55 um, packages the, the final outstanding bits especially the energy performance of buildings directive is a is a major uh, challenge that is has been put at Spain's door <laughs> and uh, and the pressure is on <laughs> yeah no pressure <laughs> well, we've, we've got to do it in the coming months, um, absolutely, <laughs> to make sure it does happen in the way in which it's been envisaged. And so with that, I think we're, we're passed to Cathy Madden, who um, is um, a climate advisor at the Royal Institute of um, Architects of Ireland. She's actually joining us from Australia. Cathy, hi. Um, I'm sure we're going to see you in a second. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and so we really wanted to give you an impression of all the different things that are happening through our member organizations in the mem various member states and, and what a magnificent job um, uh, architects are doing. And there are so many of these pockets of excellence. The, the crucial thing is to get the legislation in place to not just make these pockets of excellence, but actually scale it up and make this part of European culture. And with that, Cathy, over to you. advisor at the Royal Institute of Architects and today I'm going to give a brief overview of three Irish case studies that focus on retrofitting so it'll be uh, short and sharp and uh, I know we're probably got a lot more speakers to come so I'll, I'll keep it moving. So before I do I just want to give some context in terms of the RAI's approach to the climate crisis. The drive and focus for us as an institute is to assist our members to adapt to the challenges ahead and future changes in legislation. The recently updated RAI strategy embeds the principles of our sustainability policy. Um, some examples of our publications focused on driving change include the RAI DFMA guide, our BIMPAC2, Sustainable Design Pathways guide, and the RAI 2030 Climate Challenge. The Climate Challenge sets out targets across four key areas and three different typologies. I'll try and refer to these targets in upcoming slides where the data is available. So our first case study is called The Willows and it's set in Dublin um, it's a domestic retrofit. So all these projects you'll see are three examples of retrofit projects across different typologies. So as I said, the first is a domestic example. This is a, a great example of an architect architectural solution to an existing problem. Um, the, the project shown here on the left sits in stark contrast to its neighbouring house, which is a mirror image of its former self. So it's quite a, quite a dramatic change. The brief for this project was very simple. Additional floor space for a large growing family. And in addition, the thermal performance of the house had to be completely upgraded. The project was designed using Enerfit, the passive house standard for retrofitted buildings. Added value was created both literally and figuratively. Approximately 100 square meters of additional floor space was created by extending upwards with a new floor instead of outwards. You can see from the street elevation in the top corner, the contrast of the 1970s infill against the street context and how the retrofit of the willows successfully complements the existing street character of the neighboring three-story Victorian houses and also the 1919-10 houses adjacent. The original house had very poor natural ventilation, no mechanical ventilation in the bathrooms, a kitchen and carpets throughout. During construction, extensive mold growth inside the stud partitions in the kitchen were discovered as a result of water leaks. 
A fabric first approach was taken using high performance windows and doors, good levels of insulation and air tightness measures. These elements ensure the ongoing high performance and low energy costs of the house well into the future, representing real value for money. In addition, as the uh, thermal performance of the envelope was so effective, there was no re real requirement for central heating systems. So the savings of this were offset, uh, offset against the cost of the high specification building fabric. Passive design considerations included the room layout and appropriate orientation, relying on heat gains from sunlight, cooking and washing to keep the internal environment at a steady temperature with minimal fluctuations. Importantly, solar shading was provided to avoid summer overheating. Some of the key outcomes are listed here, as you can see. Although the floor area of the original house was increased by more than 50%, the overall energy consumption of the house decreased by an amazing 74%. Most interestingly, the primary energy, energy demand estimated in Enerfit was 94 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per year versus the actual energy consumption, which was just over 33 kilowatt hours. And this is based on meter readings during the first year of occupation. This figure is well within the 2030 target for operational energy use under the RAA climate challenge. And because it was decided to retain the existing structure as far as practical, the resulting carbon emissions were calculated at 282 kilograms of carbon per meter squared, again, well within the RAI climate challenge 2030 figure of 625. The Willows won the RAI Architecture Award for Sustainability and the Net Zero Ireland Awards in 2022. But the real success of this project, I think, is in the complete regeneration and revitalization of the site and home, and also its positive contributions to the streetscape. Our next project is St. Brickens Park in Arbor Hill. This is a senior citizen housing block. And it's part of Dublin City Council's bedsit amalgamation program, which aim to upgrade their typically small single room units into one bed apartments. The program focused particularly on bedsits that are normally let to elderly residents, addressing a lack of space and comfort. This demographic, as we all know, is particularly susceptible to fuel poverty. The case study focuses on the final block to be retrofitted, highlighted here in pink, which delivered 11 refurbished apartments. The other two blocks were previously upgraded to a BER standard, BER being our EPC uh, certificate rating of B3 in 2016, and uh, the other block in 2018 upgraded to a BER B1. As each retrofit improved performance, Dublin City Council decided to redevelop the final block to the Enerfit standard. The most innovative feature of this project lies not so much in how it was refurbished, but more in how the construction and design teams engaged with passive principles on site. <coughs> Excuse me. The council made it a requirement that the contractor and his team undergo passive house training. This also included a substantial number of council personnel. Improved thermal comfort was achieved by externally insulating the walls, the floors and roof, and installing high performance external windows and doors. This was coupled with attaining a high standard in air tightness, eliminating and minimizing thermal bridges and using mechanical ventilation with heat recovery in each apartment. Council um, decided to educate the tenants to ensure they understood the proper workings of their home before they moved in. The work done on this block was also valuable to Council in developing knowledge for subsequent retrofits in terms of buildability and costs. The scheme enabled residents to remain in their neighbourhood in more appropriate accommodation. It also, pro uh, it also promoted urban renewal as the dereliction rate was reversed and community areas revitalised by the upgrade in housing quality. Looking at the outcomes here, implementing the Enerfit standard achieved a minimum 80% reduction in energy use and approximately 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. 
the BER rating jumped significantly from an E2 to an A3 rating and the gas supply was completely eliminated. In 2019, the project was awarded the Excellence in Residential Renovation Award and was also shortlisted, shortlisted for the SEAI Energy Awards. But the real success of this project can be summed up in a letter sent to one, from one of the tenants to Dublin City Council. It says, this is my dream home, my piece of heaven on earth. Every morning I wake up, I still think I'm dreaming to have such an unbelievable home. It has brought and is still giving me peace, happiness, security and well-being. I think that says it all. And then our final case study is the Rediscovery Centre in Ballymun. This was a, a project done in conjunction between the Rediscovery Centre and Dublin City Council. And they partnered to regenerate a defunct, derelict and contaminated district heating boiler house originally constructed in the 1960s. The aim of the project was to create a national centre of excellence in the education of sustainable development and to inspire, inform and lead positive behavioural change with respect to the circular economy. <coughs> A core ambition of the project was to demonstrate the environmental value associated with building, fabric and content reuse rather than demolition. However, stripping back uh, an old industrial building for reuse can bring with it many surprises. Maximising existing materials on site required a great deal of flexibility on the part of the design and build teams. The site required some small amount of decontamination due to its history as a dumping ground for construction waste. However, this did not add too much um, of a significant cost to, um, to the overall budget. The process of choosing construction materials was based on an ordered prioritisation. First priority was given to materials salvaged from the boiler house itself. Next in line came building materials available locally from other buildings or demolition site. Thirdly, uh, third was given to sustainable, natural, renewable materials or those made from recycled waste. One example um, of such reuse is the original aluminium louvers, which you can see here on the left of the screen, which helped to dissipate the excess heat generated by the boiler house original um, 35 tonne boilers. They were later recut and formed into aluminium shingles used on the facade. The, um, the project became a test bed of different construction techniques and building systems to illustrate the potential reuse. An improbable range of technologies were accommodated, including an air to water heat pump, a stove fueled by on site willow plantation, and a combined heat and power unit as well as both solar thermal and photovoltaic panels. Such an array of technologies could be seen as excessive were it not for the role of the building as a demonstration project. Looking at some of the outcomes, the overall embodied carbon of the project was not calculated, unfortunately. However, elemental aspects were evaluated. It was estimated that approximately 55 tonnes of embodied carbon were avoided by reusing the structure. The building energy rating achieved was an A2, and it was also awarded the SEAI Energy Award and the Green Construction Awards. There are two key lessons that jump out from this project in terms of circularity. Uh, the first relates to compliance under the Irish Building Control Amendment regulations, uh, which proved difficult due to the, the extent of recycled materials used. The chain of providence was virtually impossible to ascertain for some of the project uh, some of the project materials and the process for approvals was protracted. The second is the requirement to be open and adaptable to material reuse. As the architects themselves described, they have to be they had to be light in their feet in responding to the site conditions as they were found. The success of this project, though, is in, in how well circularity is interwoven through so many aspects of the build and is on display for all to see and learn from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Kathy. Kathy. I'll stop sharing my screen now. It's, it's really inspiring to see these projects being developed to future EPBD standards and 
how much they contribute to quality of life improvements and also demonstrates why we need the EPBD to scale up, right? <laughs> um, and with now, I am just going to pass the microphone to Charlie. If I could ask you to be quite quick, because we are rapidly running out of time and it is quite hot in the room. So we would really like to get some breathing space soon. And we do have two more speakers after you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, yeah. Pushing the green. Thank you so much for inviting me soon. There. Yeah, okay, so I will give you some uh, <coughs> examples from the north, m mainly from uh, Sweden, um, and also uh, jump into some uh, projects in Germany. And it will not so much focus on the operational energy, it will more be on the embodied uh, uh, carbon in this uh, presentation. And the reason for that is, come on. Yeah, that um, I, I would say that in Sweden we have been fairly uh, good since the 70s to cut on, on the operational, but uh, uh, we do have a lot to do, when, uh, to do when it comes to the material. How can we use the existing material smarter and more efficient? Uh, should I point in a special direction, you think? Or somehow? Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I think there will, uh, for us at White, uh, yeah, I'm not only then with um, ACE, I'm also at White Architecture in, in Stockholm, and uh, for us it's uh, the journey working on the material and the, the circularity very much started on the interior uh, side. Here we go. Uh, because why, why starting with interior? Yeah, it's a lot easier supply chains there and we uh, could start the also convincing clients that there is a lot of money to to earn uh, looking into their storages what do they already have and how can we uh, easily retrofit those furniture and uh, make some a good identity coming out of that and um, another example where it's not only the furniture but also the uh, the interiors, and uh, you can see there, just uh, be more careful how you uh, dismantle the existing walls, and then you can reuse the material there. So, shifting standards, making reuse the, the first alternative. And this is a project up in Uppsala, where we were working with a developer called Vasakronan, one very ambitious, um, ambitious uh, in developer, and with whom we have done quite a number of uh, timber projects before, and they on this property and for them they was thinking okay let's pull it and put it down and then come up with a new uh, good timber project however then we together with the uh, developers started to making calculations here and compared doing a, a concrete traditional concrete in a new building a timber uh, uh, construction uh, and you can read out the numbers there and then on the um, uh, bottom you could see an alternative calculation for uh, keeping the existing structure and uh, um, retrofit uh, that and uh, of course uh, add some floors on top on that and both money wise and for the climate of course it was a big big win with the, uh, to, to keep the structure and money talks so we went for this solution and uh, I mean, it's no rocket science there, but it's, uh, of course, I mean, there's a lot of carbon to be saved in the existing structure. Uh, I mean, you, uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's where the m major part uh, comes when it's uh, referring to the carbon. And then, of course, you can add up with the light uh, uh, structures, timber st uh, floors on the top. And uh, it's not only the structure, it's also the foundation, of course, that is a lot uh, to gain. And then, yeah, uh, not going into the details, but uh, then uh, taking care of as much as possible on the existing uh, uh, material in, in the office building as such. 
and um, uh, making that use, uh, make use of that in other parts of the up new upcoming building. And of course, a tight uh, relation with the uh, developer and the contractor, very important, but it's also to think of new um, yeah, supply chains I, I was talking about, but it's also how do you manage the construction site? Because, I mean, you, you, you need to store things during um, uh, the, the production uh, period, etc. So there's a completely new setup, of course, you need to do. And um, also using the, the uh, new tools and also yeah, uh, ha having yeah, scanning the existing, doing the inventory, putting it into a BIM model and then uh, decide how, how to, uh, uh, to, to move on. So that was an office building, but then we in Sweden have a number, a number of those, those uh, areas, yeah. you know, um, built in the 60s uh, that um, are in poor, uh, uh, in, in quite poor, poor, uh, uh, in, not, not in a good situation there. Uh, and what's not only the building themselves, it's also a lot about the environment around them. And you need really to have, um, uh, yeah, we have also estimated that the heat islands, uh, we have heat islands even up in the north, and they are quite often in those areas because there are so many um, uh, hard surfaces and parking areas around those areas. And so the greenery helps also for the, for the microclimate, of course, in, in those areas. And that is also very important uh, w when it comes to saving energy, whether it's cooling in, in the uh, summer or uh, heating in the winter. Schools uh, like this one um, taking uh, yeah, use an old um, uh, power station that then uh, turned that into a new preschool. Of course, also using the existing uh, building, but also keeping a memory of the place, the heritage. This is a huge court uh, block in the center of Stockholm, owned by one of the main um, uh, pension funds. And, uh, you know, from the early 70s, very poor, uh, low ceiling heights. It's been office buildings, of course, then. And they couldn't simply rent it out to new uh, uh, tenants because it was too poor for offices. And, but, and then the first idea was, okay, we need to pull it down and make something out of it, new out of it. But then it was, uh, they came up in, in discussions then with the idea yeah, we have to transform it into housing and hotels and other uh, premises rather than keep it as an uh, office block. And that made uh, it possible to keep the structure. In Germany, just to finalize, uh, uh, another um, project on uh, an existing uh, factory uh, that is now turned into a a living environment, a mixed use there. Another German example in Karstadt in Berlin, where there was a parking garage that the client uh, wanted just to pull down. But rather than uh, pulling down that structure, uh, the, we proposed this um, uh, yeah, to take away every second uh, uh, floor and then put uh, um, instead uh, those light timber structure there in order to make it uh, workable for a, a working environment. And another of this uh, client uh, with a car stat that was also another big department store that was turned into uh, uh, into a office uh, block in, in this case with a new um, proposed new uh, timber facade. We didn't win this competition, but uh, still I, I want to show this because it's so much win when we can convince keeping the existing structure. And finally then, using new tools, very important uh, because we do need that, but also we need to start create new institutions, networks, to gather the stakeholders when it comes to those um, circular uh, thinking. And this is one example from Sweden we have created there and then working with those different um, yeah, ideas and doing that together, architects, contractors, developers, investors, as we have heard before. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Charlie. It's wonderful to see uh, such brilliant examples of, of retrofitting and actually with the calculated benefits, both financial and material, um, in, in these cases, um, not to mention the high quality architecture <laughs> in the process. Um, and I'm also, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned as part of the, the one of the projects the, the, the critical issue of storage of materials on site. And ACE really does have very specific recommendations around this for local authorities to develop these local storage and recertification areas for materials to be able to be traded online more uh, energetically. But of course we need the EPBD to make that work, right? Um, right. We have, I believe, Felicia online, who has been working on uh, on the uh, the award scheme of uh, Lower Saxony, and has created a, a, congr um, a, co a conglomeration, a, a, an incredible library of projects where there are various interventions, uh, both to existing buildings but also new buildings, demonstrating really high quality and high level of um, energy performance, indoor environmental quality, and, and many other aspects of the uh, new European Bauhaus. And so, Felicia, thank you so much for preparing the case studies. If I can urge you to go as quickly as you can. We, we can hear you and see you very well. Control L. If you press Control L, it will fill your screen, but it's fine anyway. Yep, perfect.
was re reinterpreted through targeted interventions in such a way that the potentially existing generosity can be experienced and used. Full use of space wouldn't no longer be conceivable as a new building, but it is conceivable as a conversion. I show you that's the situation before, typical. And here again, some impressions from the situation now. The second example is the first nominee uh, from the State Prize 22. It's the Bückeburg Documentation and Learning Site in Emmertal. The site designed by Hitler's Reichsarchitekt Albert Speer, which in terms of its importance can be placed on the same level as the Reichsparteitags ground in Nuremberg and the Tempelhofer field in Berlin, fell into oblivion after the Second World War. A short quote from the tourist assessment. Between 33 and 37, the Nazis held their harvest festival on this ridge near Hameln. Up to 1.2 million people cheered Adolf Hitler and the National Socialism in perfectly staged performances. Now, more than 80 years later, the documentation and learning sites puts history in the right light. Factual, stylistically pure and restrained. Through the minimally invasive interventions and measures, the place is made tangible and experienceable in all its dimensions and staging goosebumps included. A very successful example of doing little and achieving much. The second nominee is the sustainable refurbishment at the Liebenau Education and Meeting Center. I quote again from the jury assessment. In a participatory process with many interested parties, the subsequent use of the existing building was conceived. Today, a primary school, youth club, refugee initiative, sports club, adult education center, music school and documentation center can be found in the former school complex, which has grown steadily since the 1960s. The education and meeting center is a very successful example of an integrative and concept and implementation in an existing building. For changing user groups, potentials for ecological and social sustainability were created with a very low budget, but with well thought out approaches for which new teachers have already been enthused and won over. The third and last nominee is the district center in Hannover. I quote again from the story. The Hanover district of Stöcken is a neighborhood with challenges. Creating a new center for it is an urban planning, architectural and social task. For the new district center, an inviting architectural form was developed and visibility both internally and externally was realized in an exemplary manner. All building components are designed according to passive standards and the ventilation system is based on heat recovery. The furnishings and surfaces are on, of high quality and sufficiently robust for, for long-term and flexible use. In short, a very successful design of a new district center that invites people to stay and participate in the neighborhood. I will conclude. For our next state prize in 2024, we would like to examine whether a special query of sustainability criteria among the applicants can be implemented. This year, the Day of Architectures in Lower Saxony could serve as a model for us here. Maybe you know, the Day of Architecture is a nationwide event organized by the 16 Federal Chambers of Architects in Germany. For the first time in Lower Saxony, the applicants were specifically asked about sustainability criteria. Most applicants answered the voluntary questions. The participating properties with specific sustainability aspects are divided according to the focus areas of preservation, conversion, new living or working, tiny living and additions. And they are marked accordingly in the booklet. 
As for the state prize, there's a willingness of the, on the part of the award organizers to focus more on this topic. But how much willingness do the applicants have and how can the jury deal with this? We will discuss these exciting questions in preparation for the next award. I hope, we hope to achieve a good result for a sustainable future of our state, state prize in Lower Saxony. Thank you very much. I Thank you so much, Felicia. Now. And it's so exciting to see these projects. And also, I'm even more excited to hear that you're going oh, to I be can't hear you. plan, or at least you're planning to incorporate more metrics as well, as well to, to show, show how, how not, not just, just how the, 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 the buildings look, look and, and feel. feel. But also, but also how they, how can, they be can be compared to other, to other buildings, buildings in terms, in terms of, of their energy, energy and material, material consumption, consumption too. too. Um, thank, thank you so, you so much, much for sharing, sharing these. these. And, and over, over now, now to, to Helen. Helen. Um, Helena Helen Oror Potoki, Potoki, who is, who is the, the Circular, Circular Economy, Economy and Procurement, Procurement Officer, Officer of, of ICLEI. Uh, uh, we've, we've been working, been working together, together on the research, on the research project. project. I'm going, I'm going to, to shift again. Uh, the uh, Arctic Council, Council and ICLEI, and, and you're going, you're going to be showing, showing some of the, the, the results. results. Again, Again, if, if I, I could, could urge you to, you to be on time. On time. I wish I was origin. origin. I don't want, I don't to, want to be the barrier between, between you and a drink, drink so, so I think, I think we can uh, uh, pass, pass on. on. Um, so so ICLEI is a network of city governments, so we work with cities across Europe, so this presentation is some of the lessons learned that we have seen in the Bosco Circular Project. So I'm pushing to the converted. You know there's challenges and huge opportunities in the built environment. And a circular economy approach could reduce embedded energy by 50% and including all these wonderful benefits. When you think about circular economy buildings, you can think about reuse of materials, using more, more innovative, innovative approaches, approaches like, like mycelium mushrooms or uh, uh, recycled, recycled wood, wood or, having or having these green facades or green roofs. roofs. So, so often, often when people, people think about circularity in buildings, buildings they think about, about the material aspect. aspect. But, but there's also this other dimension, dimension of what's the end use. A building that's circular has to meet the needs of people. So we have seen this example in Chile where people, people living, living in favelas, favelas um, often, often build their own homes with what they can find. find. And, and this architect, architect Alejandro Aravena, Aravena has, developed has developed this concept of a half-built half house. house. Because it's, it's better, better to have, have a half, half well-built well house and a full, a full house, house that's, that's a bit crappy and will, will be not, not a, um, holding on to the to test of time. time. So he so designed these homes so, so they, with, with a budget, budget of about $7,000, so, so people, people can, can have, have a house with a bathroom, bathroom a, bedroom, a bedroom, and a kitchen, and a kitchen that's well as built. built. And then, and the, then rest the rest of the house, of the house as, as the family, family grows, grows, there's more kids, kids less kids, kids et cetera, can evolve, evolve according, according to needs. needs. So it's also, it's also important, important to think about what's the needs of society, people, individuals, when designing the built environment. So, to, to have, have more, more circular buildings, buildings, we need, we need more, more people, people that have the skills and knowledge of how, of how to, to do this. this. In, Europe, in Europe, we're seeing a huge, huge skills gap. gap. One, One of three in, out of four, four companies, companies are finding, are finding difficulties, difficulties hiring, hiring people with the right, the right skills. skills. And that's, and that's not, not across, across just, just the contracting sector, sector. It's, across it's across the whole, whole economy. economy. So, so we, we need, need to have more people know how to build buildings. Um, it's, about it's about what we're, we're saying, saying, having, having more, more youth, youth and, and the, the gap, gap that we're seeing in the economy. economy. So, so uh, throughout, throughout the Bosco, the Bosco Circular, Circular Project, project we're, looking we're looking at what, at what architects, architects, bricklayers, bricklayers plumbers, plumbers, et cetera, the skills, the skills that, skills that you, you need to have to have an entire value chain, chain of the built environment that is more circular. So we're looking at different countries across Europe and seeing what has been done. So. Our role, Our role as ICLEI, we, we have developed, developed a, a um, policy, policy guidance for how policymakers policy and cities across Europe can uh, uh, simulate skills. And we, and we have found, found these four, uh, six strategies. strategies. We, have we have also found, found many, many examples, examples that you can, can explore further, further in your report. report. But, but in essence, a city can, can have strategies and plan and create this long-term vision and act as a master planner. 
Also, also public, public procurement, procurement is, is one, one of the, the most powerful, powerful tools, tools that a city can use, use for, this, for this, and I'll speak, speak about, about it a bit longer. longer. It can, it can also, also um, provide, provide grants, grants and subsidies and economic, and support, economic support uh, companies, companies and, and SMEs, SMEs that are trying to move in this, in this um, sector. sector. So, so by supporting, supporting these, these, then, then um, you can you have, have an evolution, evolution of the sector. Grants and subsidies. And also cities are the center of a network between academia, businesses, citizens. So coordinating and orchestrating uh, a whole city is important as well. And this is also for um, values chains and materials that need to be stored, etc. And what we're starting to see in the very few examples, but we would like to see more in the future, is thinking about the urban planning, not just one building that's circular, entire districts and how materials flow across a city. So. Public procurement, Public procurement is one, is one of, the of the most powerful, powerful tools, tools that, that a city can use. Public, Public procurement in Europe accounts for 14% of uh, uh, the, EU the EU GDP, or 14% of the EU GDP, the EU GDP is spent, spent like that. that. And as, as Greta has, has uh, mentioned, mentioned, if this if money is well spent, spent, you can have, have huge amount of savings. savings. So, so imagine, imagine what, can what can be done if more buildings were procured circularly, in a more circular way. So by managing the, the huge, amount huge amount of buildings, buildings like schools, like schools uh, city halls, uh, streets, uh, streets that the that cities have, have, we can really aim to uh, reduce, reduce our, our climate, climate impact. impact. So, so also, also within, within the project, project we, have we have found, found different, different strategies that public, public procurers can use, can use to simulate, simulate skills. skills. One, One is, is to train, train their own staff, staff on, on these, these questions. questions. Uh, uh, because, because how can you buy something if you don't really know what you're buying in the first place? Then, then it's talking, talking to, to the market. The market. What, what can companies, what companies, companies do, now do now and what, and what they, they can, can maybe do in five, ten years, years time is also, is also important, important to know. To know. Um, they, they should procure selective, selective demolition, demolition and, um, and um, deconstructions, deconstructions of buildings. Of buildings. I'll, I'll give you an example, you an example of that, of that later. later. And for, and for any, any building that needs to be put on the market, it has, it has to be designed, designed to last. last. It, it has, has to meet the needs of people. people. You have, have to uh, design, uh, design, uh, design out waste from the from start. The start. Um, for, for any, any existing, existing buildings, buildings, you need, need to, to uh, maintain, maintain retrofit, retrofit, extend, extend the lifestyle, lifestyle of buildings, buildings or, upgrade or upgrade their purposes, purposes where, where needed. needed. One, One example, example that was mentioned, that was mentioned uh, by, by Katie, Katie in Ireland, Ireland is uh, including, uh, including training, training clauses, clauses in, in contracts. contracts. So, a so a public authority, authority can, can give, give a contract, a contract to a company, company and, tell and tell them, we will, we will only award you this uh, contract if you if train your workers, workers on these skills for the project. project. And, that's and that's one of, one of the most, the most uh, quite, quite impactful, and, and we're, we're only starting, starting to see this happening now. And when recruiting a team of urban planners, it should, it should be a, be a diverse, diverse team, team but they also, also know how to how do circularity, circularity as, well. as well. So I'll so just I'll give just one give example, example uh, to illustrate this. this. So, so for, another for another project, project that um, ICLE is, is involved in, in, we have piloted six demonstration, demonstration uh, projects across, across Europe. Europe. Um, um, so, so these, these different, different cities. cities. Um, um, and, and I'll be mentioning an example from Bordeaux. Which, which is a city, city 30, 30 kilometers, kilometers into the, the Arctic, Arctic Circle. Circle. So, so very, very far, far north, north, very, very long, long way, way to get, get there. there. So, so Bodo has, has two airports. airports. One, One is the most, most northern, northern uh, NATO, NATO airport, airport in the, in the world, world uh, uh, near the North, north Pole. Pole. Um, and, and I don't know if you can, can see, see uh, uh, it's, it's by the seaside. And they have next to it a civil airport. For some, For some obscure, obscure NATO, NATO reasons, reasons the military, military airport will be for moved further, further up, up north. north. Um, um, so, so the city, the city will, have will have two airports. airports. Instead, Instead of, um, um, so they, they don't, don't have, have the need, need to have a bigger airport, airport or, or two airports. airports. So, they so they decided, decided to move the civil airport, airport to the, the old military, military airport. airport and transform, and transform the, the current, current civil, civil airport, airport into, into a, new, a new, entirely new, new city, city district. district. But to, to do, do that, that uh, they procured um, three, three architect, architect firms, firms to develop, to develop a, concept a concept for, for 
for what, what an vision for what the new city centre can look like and what the new airport can look like. And their plan is to move the least amount of materials when we designing this. So when I visited uh, Bodo, this is the runway. It's like um, three kilometers long. So what do you do with an entire runway of an airport? And they also have these um, sort of storage spaces for different things in the airport. So the city has been asking like students to pitch ideas for what they can see and think. So the project hasn't started yet, but they have used a very collaborative approach to very really think what could be the best solution. And they have used 3D visualization tools, life cycle costing to see what would be the least impactful um, um, option. option. So, so we, we will, will hope, hope to see this airport in the coming years. So, uh, time, time to go. go. And this, and is, this one is one of six, six projects. projects. So, so, we have one of selective demolition in Raskilde, in Denmark. You can find more information on the City Loops website, as well in Mikkeli, where they're selectively demolition, demolishing a hospital and healthcare center. So, you can, you can find, find on these QR, QR codes, codes the training materials, materials with, with a lot, lot of examples, examples across Europe and, and the guidance for policymakers. And thank you. Oh, do you, oh, you want, want to scan? scan? <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for sticking with us in this uh, uh, sweltering heat. heat. It wouldn't be a, uh, EU Sustainable, sustainable energy, energy Week without, without sweltering, sweltering heat and, and apocalyptic, apocalyptic weather, weather, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> True, True to form, form. we've, we've done, done it again. again. I, I, I know I there were some, some comments, comments online. online. Um, um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just, just um, read, read out, out one, one or two. two. Permit, Permit me to mention, to mention that the that sustainable, sustainable that sustainable does not exist without mobility and or access and inclusive environment. And I, and hope, I hope the, uh, the, uh, the architect, architect from, from Athens, Athens will, will be able, able to look at the, the um, uh, EU Bauhaus, Bauhaus and, and, and understand, understand how, how the, these, these principles, principles are really, really embedded, embedded at the, the core of uh, uh, New, New European Bauhaus. Bauhaus. Um, um, and, someone's and someone's applauding, applauding on, on the comment on bringing, bringing architecture to average people, people um, and, 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 and how, how, wonder, wonder, how amazing, amazing that is to see in these case studies. And... Just, Just in conclusion, in conclusion uh, uh, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be us organizing a conference without an ulterior motive, motive which, which is the the, the, the amazing, amazing thing that, thing we, that have we have seen today, today in terms, terms of the cross-section of projects project and case studies. It is, it is something, something that we're, we're, we, are we are working, working to, to, combine to combine and include and to inform the, the advice and and. Communication, communication of our, of our member organizations, organizations across, across uh, the, the member states, states of the EU uh, to, uh, to get, get as, as much, much support as we can in the, in the member states towards, towards the passage of the EPPD and, and also the, um, the, the, the incorporation of the new European, European Bauhaus, Bauhaus principles, principles in as many uh, projects, projects as, as we, we can, can possibly see and, and as much guidance as we can possibly see. And, and huge, huge thanks, thanks to, to um, DG, DG Culture for, for funding this event, this event and, and huge thanks, thanks to the audience, audience both, both here in the room and online, 40+, plus, plus, uh, uh, for your uh, attention, attention, questions, questions and, and interest. interest. See you again, See you again very, very soon. soon.